Well, today, visiting us is Mitch Patel. He's Ish's son. He's been in Cleveland as long as I can remember. Extremely successful. And the owner and president of Vision Hospitality, which is absolutely huge. Than you would think. Twenty-eight thousand. Twenty-eight thousand. That's that, it, it's a lot. That's uh, impressive. Congratulations. You know, I don't know how big it can get, but uh, but that's that's a lot. So in nineteen eighty, y'all, your dad moved from California, right? That's right. So you would have been about. So I was ten. Did well, you, do you remember living in California much? I do. Yes. Vaguely, or no, I remember quite a bit. Living in what, California. what part of California? It was uh, Davis, California, near Sacramento. So it was about, today it's, you could say it's a suburb of Sacramento, yeah. but it was in the northern California. Why did, why did, I remember Ish, I was friends with Bruce Renner, and Bruce Renner was friends with Ish. That's right. And, that, and he was just a, just a owner of a, of a small motel at the time. What was it, Scottish Inns, that I is guess? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Did, was it was it semi run down when he bought it, or what was its situation? It, it, it was absolutely run down. Um, so it was a Scottish, and they were selling the parent company of Scottish Inns were selling these hotels up and down. They were on I seventy five, you know, mm -hmm. from Michigan down to Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, when he bought it, um, it was pretty run down. And I remember. Um, that uh, there were mushrooms growing out of the carpet um, because God. of the moisture yeah. and so forth. The thing was just falling apart. Uh, it was neglected. And uh, he wind up uh, purchasing it um, and uh, spending some money on it, giving it some TLC, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of businesses mm -hmm. uh, that you have to do to be successful in them. And uh, he upgraded it D, to an Econa Lodge. So it was an Econa Lodge after that, and um, which, and, which I guess was a lower tier at the time, right? Maybe it's still lower tier today. Yeah. So I yeah. almost half jokingly say yeah. that, yeah. you know. So that's telling you how bad of a hotel it was when it was a Scottish Inn back then. I believe it was built pretty well whenever it was built. It was modular. I, I remember vividly the working uh, at that, uh, I'll say motel, I'm not going to even say hotel, mm -hmm. right? Um, as a 10-year-old all the way through high school, and uh, we had to replace a lot of floors and just a lot of, just a lot of things in that hotel over the years. It was a modular construction. It's amazing how that's come full circle as a contractor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the modular was just a way of bringing in these hotel rooms uh, at the time via a truck, mm -hmm. right? And in some controlled environment, some manufacturing plant. And then they would truck them to the job site and just basically set these rooms in place. And that's how they built that Scottish Inn back in the day. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and so, but there was a lot of challenges to that. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's still still around today. From how, how did he land on Cleveland, Tennessee? Because he was looking for, was he, did he own a motel in, yeah. in California? Yes, absolutely. So. You know, I, I go back a little bit further, D. Um, my father came to this great country with $8 in his pocket uh, to pursue something pretty powerful, and that's the American dream, right? Uh, the American dreams. Did he have a sponsor? He, well, he came for, for education. So he was, uh, you know, he studied food. I mean, sorry, he studied um, dairy technology in, uh, in India. And then uh, he got his master's uh, in that uh, field in India. And then he had an opportunity to come 
to the United States to pursue his studies further. And so he went on to the University of California, Davis, and uh, pursued, he wound up, wound up pursuing his PhD in food microbiology at the University of California, Davis. And that's how he came to this country. And so what, what inspired him to be in the hotel business? Yeah, it's an interesting story, you know. So here, after he, um, you know, gets his degree, he gets a job as a research scientist at a pickle company in Lodi, California, near Stockton, California. That's a little, that's a little rough for area. It's it? really rough. They, they call Stockton the armpit of California. Okay, so that's telling you how rough it is. That the city actually filed for bankruptcy not too long that's ago. That's where Nick Diaz, Nick and Nate Diaz are from, Stockton. Okay, which is next to Lodi. Yes, yes. So, so moved uh, moved us into you know a little townhouse in Stockton, California, while he was worse working as a as a research scientist at this pickle company, and then he decides this is where the American dream takes a little turn. Right? He decides to lease. He couldn't afford to buy this motel. He decides to lease an 11 room motel called the Stevens Motel in Stockton, California. And uh, we move into the apartment behind the motel office. So we save on living expenses. My dad's going to continue to work as a research scientist, and it gives an opportunity for my mother and the family, this time I'm like seven years old, mm -hmm. to help out in the family business. So I'm, I remember helping cleaning, clean rooms, doing laundry, taking out the trash, even painting doors, helping my mom paint mm -hmm. doors, you know, this what? business. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, so that was our introduction to the motel business in California. And so when, so when, when Scottish Inns was gonna sell off some of their facilities, mm -hmm. He researched it and thought, right. well, there's one here and I'll just come to Cleveland? Well, this is where a network and relationships are important, right? Uh, so his good friend um, bought a Scottish Inn in Lebanon, Tennessee, which is just east of Nashville, yeah. right? And then so he built a relationship with the parent company of Scottish Inn because he bought this, this uh, motel in Lebanon. And so... There were two for sale, one in Athens and one in Cleveland, Tennessee. But he needed somebody to help operate it, be a partner with him. And so he reached out to my father. And my father thought about it and decided, you know what? That's probably a good move. This was a small 11-room motel that we were at. He was looking at some doing something a little bigger. And then he wound up visiting Athens and then visiting Cleveland. The physical motel in Athens was a little bit newer and nicer than the one in Cleveland, but he liked the town of Cleveland better. And he decided to buy the one in, uh, in Cleveland, the Scottish Inn on exit 25. And my father and a couple of partners, I think he had two other partners, so there was three of them, wound up buying that motel um, in 1980. And we wound up moving, by the way, Cross country, in the middle of my fifth grade school year, D. Uh, that was my fifth different public elementary school. At that point. At that point. And we moved cross country in the middle of my fifth grade school year from California to Cleveland, Tennessee. So there was a cultural shock, right? Uh, you know, you're here, I look a little different. <laughs> You know, my family originally is from India, and we're in this small conservative town of Cleveland, Tennessee. And you had you were even a different culture, plus coming from a different background of California. To, it was like four or five different things, that, I, not against you, but just different. Absolutely, D. And it was the middle of the school year. Not Which, even, what school not even did summer. you enroll in? E.L. Ross. E.L. Ross. E.L. Ross Elementary I went there. School. I went there. Okay, great. Who was your teacher? Oh, I, I'll have to pull, I'll have to pull up. I was only there in fifth grade for a couple of months because it was in the middle of the year. So, and then Who's, sixth grade, but I will get that information because I still have that little, uh, little picture. Um, you remember Mr. Finley, the librarian, was he there when you were there? I am pretty sure that name sounds familiar. He was an older guy, okay. real skinny because mm -hmm. the library was right in the center. Yes. Yes. Who was the first person you 
remember meeting in the fifth grade? Do you remember? Oh, boy. That? Um, I, I remember a few. Um, there was a person that I could not forget because he was like six foot. I mean, he, he, not at that time he was that tall, but he was taller than everybody else. And it was uh, um, Flip Parks. Uh, if you remember, um, uh, he wound up playing football in uh, Cleveland High School, but uh, somehow I connected with him. And uh, but there were there were a few others. Uh, do, do you remember him being friendly and open? And yeah, I think that um, you know, look, I mean, you're you're ten years old, and um, it's. Uh, I I will tell you my experiences in Cleveland, even since 10, all the way to then junior high school to high school, you know, I, what I remember about Cleveland is the people have always been very open, very friendly. Um, and that's, that's really my memories and, uh, people, you know, kids could be mean sometimes. We all know mm -hmm. that, but overall I had a great experience uh, growing up in uh, Cleveland. Do you feel like that you're, since you're you're Indian, do you feel like you're? It's a little bit. I'm not going to say racist because that's not the thing no. at all. But just, uh, um, I don't know, not different, but just uh, maybe not. Uh, I don't even want. To, did, did you experience any of that at all? Here? I I did experience some. I don't. I'm not going to tell you I experienced it in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. But I have experienced it uh, in the South, and, I, and you still continue to, to experience some of it, uh, particularly in some of the smaller cities, like you go down to Georgia. And, but, you know, um, I wouldn't say nothing horrible. I mean, yes, have I been called some names that I shouldn't have, even though they probably didn't know me. They just called me that, uh, mm -hmm. judging them uh, judging me by the, just the way I looked. Uh, and, you know, that could sting a little bit. Sure. but. But I, um, you know, my father, you know, he was, he was an incredible mentor in many ways uh, uh, for me. And my father, and I, I really believe that the experiences that you have in life define you and make you who you are today, right? And, um, you know, we'll talk about business in a little bit and, and what we were able to do in our company. But I really believe that you know, those experiences that I had going to five different elementary schools, moving from California to Cleveland, Tennessee, and being in this, these new environments with new people, right? And it allowed me to be able to, to integrate and connect with people in a unique way. I would sometimes complain to my father that, that this is not fair. Like, why... Why are we doing this, right? I mean, like any child would mm, yeah. uh, complain to their parents. And my dad would say, look, life's not going to be fair, okay? You're going to have a lot of obstacles. And I don't think he's intentionally teaching me mm -hmm. uh, those obstacles, but he knew that these things would help me become who I am today. And so I, I will never forget, he would tell me to put your hand out first, smile wa wider, uh, be nicer, uh, work harder. And is that fair? Maybe not. But if you want to, if you want to achieve great things, these are the things that you have to do. And too often people just think that, you know what, I've been dealt a bad hand and it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault is why I'm here. And this is the greatest country in the world with the greatest people, Absolutely. bar none. I travel, look, now I have the ability to do that. Didn't have the ability to do that when we were younger. We didn't have much, right? We grew up poor. Mm -hmm. But I like to travel all over the world now. And I'll tell you why. Not because there are so many great things to see. Sure, there are different cultures and, you know, different people, different uh, foods and so forth. But... I really want my kids to come back here and appreciate the greatest country in the world. And really too often we take, we take what we have for granted. You know, go travel, go to just Mexico and come yeah. back. So, you know, do we have challenges? 
Sure. We have challenges. Of course, every country, every society, every culture, every community has challenges. But trust me, our challenges are a lot less than other, other places. And so appreciate what we have. And it may not be a fair for every single person out there, but you have the opportunity to do amazing things. And I have seen that over and over and over. And so I had that little chip deep on my shoulder, right? Yeah, because it's hard to come from, from, from nothing to something. No. And, and you can be real smart, a hard worker, and all of those things and still never get there. Do you agree with that? Well, I'm sure um, you, I, I'm sure there's a lot of smart people that have worked hard, have not uh, gotten to where um, they want to be, but I don't think you give up. I think people give up too easy sometimes when the first obstacle they hit or the second obstacle hit, they hit. You have hit a lot of obstacles. I have hit a lot of, there are so many times I thought about quitting early on, not, not today. Well, even, even today I get those feelings. Don't you think, man, why, why in the world? Because we have to thread the, yeah. so many times I literally have to thread the needle. Yeah. And I think they're different today, those, uh, those obstacles. Um, and it's just, you know, our, look, we're, we're getting a little older. We may not have that energy and that passion that we did 20 years ago. So sometimes, yeah, I go, why, do, why should I have to do this, right? Or why do I need to do this? But I'm very careful what I choose to want to do today. And um, where 25 years ago, you know, there wasn't a lot of choices, right? And uh, but, but the things yeah. we get into today, we can't get out of them that quick. I mean, let's say you build a, a hotel that maybe is the wrong place or the sure. wrong thing, and all of a sudden you can't just bail. No, you can't. You can't bail. So, um, so how do you? You got to work through that, and it takes time. So, I went to school with this. Change the subject a little bit. I went to school with a guy that was really smart. I mean, this guy had the whole world ahead of, him. and uh, he ended up with a handicapped child. And all he's done since then is cared for that handicapped child. Very noble. So you look, you think about that and think, so we can't necessarily look at success as, as far as the bank account right. and say, oh, that guy's successful. No question. Cause, so that, that gets difficult. But do you think that sometimes the things we go through, it the experiences we have is, is what you're saying. It makes us, makes us become the person, but also makes us successful in the things. Yeah. I remember uh, 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 Slumdog Millionaire. It's one of yeah. my favorite movies. Oh, That's so good. Remember that guy, he was talking about his experiences is why he got all the questions mm -hmm. right. And that's, that's right. that is so true. Not that we're in a game show, but, yeah. but we could have a situation come up and we say, boy, what am I going to do about that? And you, your mind flashes back to that, to that time, sure. and you're able to take that information and, and make this work. But do you think that, obviously, hard work, which one do you think is better, hard work or intelligence for, uh, for financial success? Well, both of them would be, uh, would be great, right? But I think hard work. Uh, so my father um, ha has said this many times. I will will beat IQ. And so your drive, your passion, your, the fire in your belly, your commitment, your um, willingness to not give up, um, your fight will beat anybody with uh, high intelligence any day. And I've seen it time and time again if we're strictly talking about uh, business. And we can talk about that and in, in, in even athletics and other um, you know, talent, uh, as well as someone working hard. Um, you know, you hear that all the time, but yeah. So look, and if you have both, uh, that's a lethal combination, but I think that, uh, that this, again, it's about opportunities. There are a lot of opportunities out there. 
Boy, there are. There's there almost, are a lot. I'm drowning in them, aren't you? There's a lot of opportunities, <laughs> but it's that uh, that commitment, uh, you know, and not giving up and uh, continuing. And you know, we, we talk about work. You, you brought up working hard. Well, I've got to I got to bring this up. So, I wound up being an engineer. Um, I went on to college to be an engineer. What kind? I was a civil engineer, and you deal with civil engineers civil, yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. So. One of the reasons I became an engineer is I grew up in the motel business, cleaning rooms, doing laundry, right, at the, mm -hmm. at the Scottish Inn, and then yeah. Econa Lodge. And uh, so that's the last thing I want to do is pursue it as a career, right? And my parents didn't want me to pursue this business either because they were working hard, manually, physically, so we can become a professional, be a doctor, be a lawyer. You know, business was not looked um, well upon, okay, in my family or in our community because there were gas stations, there were small shops, there were a small motel, there were a dry cleaner, you know, and you had to work hard in those businesses. So I wound up be being an engineer and after college, went to University of Tennessee, got my master's in it, got a job down in Atlanta, I was designing roads, bridges, doing traffic plans, traffic studies. For a company or a... For a consulting a, company. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our work uh, was... We were doing a lot of the work with uh, Georgia Department of Transportation, Gwinnett County, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the counties around Atlanta. A lot of public work that, uh, that we were getting jobs for. But I didn't enjoy it, Dee. I'm in my cubicle, really didn't enjoy the work that I was doing. And I'm going to get to this about working hard. Um, you know, it's the same person mm -hmm. that I was today, right? Yeah. Same person. But I couldn't wait till lunchtime. I couldn't wait till 5 o'clock. I couldn't wait to go home. And, and Sundays, I had the Sunday night blues because oh, <laughs> Monday morning I had to go to work, right? And, uh, and so I just did not enjoy it. And I didn't have a passion for it. And so there was a, there was, here's a way to know if you're in the right industry, right business. The engineering magazine, our, our industry journal, would be sitting in my little cubicle. Mm -hmm. I didn't even want to open it. It was the latest sewer lines, water lines, right? Signal studs, uh, traffic signals. Uh, and so fast forward, I did this for three years. And my father and mother would say, you got to keep pursuing this. You're being lazy. You've got a master's in engineering and this is what you need to be doing. I knew my heart wasn't in it, but I actually started believing in that, that maybe it's me. You what know? was you 24, 25? Yeah, around there. You know, I, I started, I guess, when I was 22 mm. and then up until about 22, 23 and up until about 24, 25, I worked uh, um, as an engineer. And I just didn't enjoy it. And then there was an opportunity to get into this business, and I took it. But I found my passion where I never expected to. And when you have a passion for something, you're going to work harder. We'll overcome those obstacles, and we'll find success. And I really, really believe in that. Uh, so I, don't, I think I would have been a good engineer, maybe below average engineer, and, but I wouldn't have been a great engineer because I didn't have a passion for it. And it's the same person. And now I get to do what I absolutely love. Now, it wasn't easy the first 18 months to 24 months being in this business. But I, uh, I fell in absolute love with it. And, you know, 26 years later, I still love it. And you can probably hear that from my voice. You know, I just love this business, every aspect of it. And I think when you have a pa true passion for something, you're just going to do better at it. And so we're always taught the got to work hard, got to work hard if you want to be successful. But it's hard to work hard in something you don't love. It's and, really and, hard. And that's so there's something we say in our company and it's a uh, place people are inherently different, right? I'm different, you're different than me, you might have different strengths and weaknesses, I might have different strengths and weaknesses, I sure do know my weaknesses, and I do know my strengths, right? 
And so place the squirrel in the tree and the fish in the sea is what we say. You know, so I was that squirrel in the water, drowning as an engineer, unhappy. And guess what I get to do every day today? I get to climb. You're not having the Sunday night blues. No more. Today's Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. I am so looking forward. Even my wife knows it's Sunday, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. I am so looking forward to coming into the office tomorrow morning because I want to go conquer the day, conquer the week. Got exciting things that I want to <laughs> want to do. I've got thoughts in my head that I collect over the weekend, and uh, so many things that that are going on in our company. And uh, so, yes, I'm having fun. Were you uh, when you had this opportunity to to I guess get in the motel business when you were sitting in Atlanta in the in the cubicle yeah. drawing the road profiles yeah. and stuff. Yes. And and this opportunity comes up. Did could, did you find yourself thinking, well, get these color of chairs and this type of pool furniture? Was that more of exciting thought than the work you were doing? I mean, was it that kind of a passion? And and, and we'll have a continental breakfast. And, uh, <laughs> describe the the, no. the 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 what makes what sure. was so exciting. I think that um, there's a few things probably I could I could talk about. Um, you know, engineering, I want to make it very clear, all these experiences that, that we talk about growing up, you know, mm -hmm. going to all these different elementary schools, mm -hmm. moving to Cleveland, Tennessee, um, when I was young, to being an engineer, working in the business, of course, uh, you know, all of that has defined me. Engineering has taught me so much about logic, problem solving, you know, staying disciplined, and those things are important in business. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I've always loved, even my friends back in high school at Cleveland High School will tell you, I loved art. Mrs. Kidwell, do you remember her? Art. Yeah, art. I loved art. I took uh, all four years of art in high school, um, and I had art work exhibited in high school at uh, Bradley Square Mall, you know, to the Hunter Museum mm. of Art, even as right? a high schooler. And I just loved art. So I love the creativity part, you know, of me. You know, I just love the creative side. But engineering, I couldn't de just take the road this way and this way. I couldn't just paint the yellow and white stripes purple, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that, that this development, what you do, what I do, today, development allowed me to be creative, it allowed me to really take, and I say this often, and you as a contractor and as a developer would appreciate this, to me, it's art. You know, we're taking a blank piece of canvas. It's an acre and a half or two acre piece of dirt, and it's a blank canvas. And we get to visualize what we could do with it. We get to draw what we could do with it. And then we're creating a building, right, uh, with that vision. And guess what? People get to frequent it. If it's a restaurant or if it's a hotel or if it's uh, any type of other use, you know, people get to use it and we get to admire it. And today we're building 10, 12, 15 story. We have a 40 story project that we're working on in Nashville downtown. God. And so it's so many, it, it, so much creativity is involved in it. Uh, it's not easy, but I really enjoyed that from the very beginning when I got in this business. So I had saved $3,000, D, working as an engineer. And I needed a lot more money than that. Mm -hmm. This is a very capital intensive business sure, real estate. Yeah, you know that. Absolutely. Yes, you got to convince a lender, but you also have to come up with a lot of equity yourself, right, uh, in these deals. And I, and, and you know it, so I wind up getting partners and I had to come up with my share of the equity. I'll never forget that. I had to borrow so much capital and I borrowed it from friends and family at eight, 10, 12% interest, five, $10,000 here and there. And so many people turned me down uh, so much, uh, you know, the, again, those rejections. Well, they're very discouraging, aren't they? Oh, they are. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been rejected. 
you know, absolutely. And, uh, and I could have given up so many times when I've been rejected, but I didn't. And I'm so glad that I, I didn't. And so I raised that, 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 that capital that I needed to build this hotel. And then I'm the general contractor, D. Where is that hotel at? It's in, it was on top of Hamilton Place. Bull, I mean, I say Hamilton Place, off of Shalliford Road mm -hmm. on exit five. And so we wind up building a, a hotel. Um, it was a 76-room hotel, four-story, block and plank. I was the contractor. One of the first things that I did was to get a porta potty <laughs> and then a construction trailer. Yeah. And then I had an uh, Excel spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. And then I basically, those are the basics that you need, and mm -hmm. I figured out how to build this. I wound up um, getting subcontractors, you know, and filling in the holes that oh, you have to fill in. So many holes. People don't understand. Oh, I call it connecting the dots. There's so much there. So much. I was going, I remember I would go to Home Depot and Lowe's about every day getting certain things. Uh, if you can find the subcontractor that's supposed to put in the dryer vent, they, they don't, <laughs> there's nobody, it's nobody's, there's all kinds of stuff like that. That There's so many things. Uh, and But I learned a lot, D. You know, I was, I opened this hotel on budget, uh, under budget, on time, mm -hmm. and learned so much uh, about the construction of a hotel. And then I literally, I take off my hard hat and learn how to put on a tie. I'm 27 years old, and I'm the general manager of this hotel. And I've never, I never built a shed before that, and I never managed anyone at that time, right? I mean, I was No, working. you had just... Now, you'd watched your dad manage people, I I've guess. watched my father manage a small team of people at his yeah. hotel. And as an engineer, um, I didn't have anybody under me. Um, you know, I had a supervisor above me, but that's it. So it was intimidating, um, you know, to put a staff of 25 people together. And I learned at that age, you know, to, to do that. And uh, so we struggled mightily. We did 10% occupancy first month, 15% the second month. When was you up to 40%? I would say 40%. It took probably six months before I got to 40%. That was a struggle. It was you a struggle. about got to have 40% to just turn That's right. nut. That's right, and uh, it was very difficult time. We were losing money. I thought about giving up, but you I and your, You and your partners? Well, my, I had partners, and we were all like, uh, they were worried too, but I, I really appreciate that they believed in me, and uh, even though I didn't believe in myself at that time. And, uh, but I'll tell you, we couldn't, we couldn't let the lender down, couldn't let my partners down, couldn't let my employees down, couldn't let our franchise company down. Um, so we, we doubled down, we dug in deep, and we said, we're gonna make this successful. And we were absolutely committed. And guess what? After 18 months of hard work and dedication, we became the number one hotel in the market. Did you get, uh, how, did you, how did you get it? Oops, that much. Of course, maybe it was the location too, right? Yeah. It was the location was a little off, so it needed to be marketed. Yeah. The brand, people didn't know the brand. It was Homewood Suites back then. It wasn't even part of Hilton. So the brand was uh, like Douglas Inn. I mean, you know, people yeah. don't know that brand like a day's in, right? I mean, you have to market it. And so it just takes longer when you have a brand like that. Uh, you have to... When you have a brand that's not as well known, you got to really, really, really work it. You're right. And constantly. That's right. And that's what I did. I worked it constantly. There wasn't a guest that walked through that door where I didn't talk to. And I wanted them to come back if they're on their way back from Florida, <laughs> if they were part of a larger business group. Uh -huh. uh, and most of the, their other group is staying at the courtyard across the interstate. Mm -hmm. I would do anything and everything to convince uh, the rest of them, uh, that group, to come stay at this hotel. 
I even, I would go pick up people at the airport, uh, pilots and so forth, and, even, and I would ask them what's their favorite beer, mm -hmm. and I would even put their favorite beer in the refrigerator. I would just go down to the grocery store and go get it. But that's the kind of hustle that I was doing, and, uh, and personally, and with my team, and we made sure that anyone that stayed at this hotel, they were gonna come back and they were gonna tell other people. But that was before social media. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and so it was a word And Hayward Suites was a, you thought of it as somewhere you're gonna stay for a week or something. That's right. you didn't You didn't think about it. They didn't do a real good thing of marketing as just a, a nightly stay. That's, that's Anytime it that's says right. suites, that's right. We had kitchens in every room. Yeah. So people were going, well, I'm only staying a night. What do I need all this for? Right. And, and, and uh, you were saying, I won't charge you for it. <laughs> that's right. And we, were, and we were kind of on the higher end of the products there at the time with Shalford. Yeah. So people were reluctant to, to pay, uh, you know, back then, 75 bucks a night, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's more like 49 That's right. 52 That's what the rates were going back then. Yeah. So, uh, but... I found, uh, we found success, but I found my passion, and that's, uh, and the rest is history. Did you ever think, boy, I should have stayed down there at Atlanta in that cubicle? <laughs> I'm so glad that I didn't, but there were times when early on, the first six months, nine months uh -huh. of running this hotel uh, and being a partner in it and bleeding, right? Yes, I've had many thoughts about I should have just stayed. And a lot of people go through this, D. On this side, you have guaranteed, nothing is guaranteed, right? But you have almost a guaranteed two-week paycheck, right? Every yeah. Friday, I'm yeah. getting a check. Here, in business, and those that have had businesses know this, there is no guarantee, mm -hmm. right? You have tremendous liabilities. And you're taking risks. And I'm, I'm so fortunate. And I think what happens is if you're going to take risks like that, that, do it while you're younger. Where yeah. you have less to lose. You don't have the kids. And you don't have, you know, it's a spouse. And you don't have the, the mortgage of a house and the white picket fence. And all those things. Because too often people are afraid to risk that, that right? And, and take a plunge in business. So I always tell young people that if you've got a passion uh, for something, an idea, or you want to get into business, you know, do it when you're a little bit younger. You might not be as experienced, you might, might be a little naive, but uh, you know, you're, there's less to lose at, at, at that younger age. I think that's a big thing is you, at that age, there's not much to lose and you feel like you've got a safety net of years to overcome That's right. a bad move. That's right. And maybe, and I miss that feeling. Yeah. I miss that, uh, uh, I use I use the analogy of uh, those old Westerns, the, the gunslinger. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do that then and, and <laughs> And you know you can be a little more risky, and you right. you can get your name in the paper, and you know he's the gunslinger. And but when you get older, you think, man, I I gotta send two kids to college. Right. What if they have this problem and that problem? And oh yeah, I gotta go to this. And when you get our age, you spend half your time going to funerals and weddings. That's right. <laughs> and you didn't do that then. No, you didn't. Um, the risk profile is very different. Uh, or is it in our head? Have you ever wondered that? Is it in our head? I, I think if it's in our head, it's still it's still real, right? I mean, it's in our head, and that that a lot of a lot of our you know the the, the risks and uh, of the and these ideas and thoughts. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's psychological. A lot of it. Do you think that uh, when I get to thinking about projects now, I think. Okay, now when I'm finished with that, I'll be such and such age. <laughs> so my my reward, what I'll do or sacrifice for a reward right. is a is a shorter time frame. So yeah. 
So developing a large subdivision would be less attractive to me now than building a, sure. a duplex somewhere or, yeah. or something like that. So that bothers me a little bit because, you know, I know people in their late 60s that you think are about dead, and I know people in their early 80s that I wouldn't call a name because they're so, you know, so active and have so much energy. So I'm not sure which one I'll be. You ever wonder about that? Which one will we be? <laughs> because if we're going to be the guy in his 80s that's feeling real good, then we need to be more excited about long-term things now. There's a, that's another dynamic that that I didn't realize. I think as we get older, do you, I mean, our, our, our thoughts do turn to different things. I mean, um, I, I'm absolutely, I mean, in many ways, I'm the same person, right, uh, when I was in my 20s, but I'm, I've, I'm so different uh, today in many ways, too. So when I was, I say this often, when I was 26, you know, I started, I quit engineering and took on this this opportunity, um, I didn't have money, I didn't have experience, right? I didn't have a network, but I had endless amount of time at that, at that age. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had endless amount of it. And today, you know, you're talking about patience and time is really what we're talking about. We look at that very differently. Fast forward 26, 27 years later, you, we're blessed with a network, with experiences, right? Some, some bad experiences that turned to good experiences and some good experiences, but we've, we've, we've got a lot of experiences. You know, built 60, 70 hotels, you know, in that, in that time frame. So, of course, we've gained so much knowledge. And, uh, and capital. We've been blessed with building that capital. I had $3,000 when I started the company, right, 26, 27 years ago. So, and now lenders, even the relationships that I have with banks, you know, I used to beg a lender <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to do a project. Yeah. Uh, and I, would, I was flying around. I remember I went to Chicago. I'll never forget this. I was, it was my second hotel venture. And it was a very difficult time getting a loan. And I had an appointment uh, with a banker in a bank out of Chicago. And I flew down there, put on my suit, put on a tie, and I had my pitch ready, and the banker didn't even show up. Golly. Was not even there. I literally came back without meeting anybody. And besides, you know, the, the, the administrative yeah. assistant. And... Today, you know, we have three, four term sheets per deal because of the reputation, the track record, the balance sheet that we've developed, right? And it takes a while to get there. But getting back to what I was saying about time, I look at time differently now. You know, I don't, uh, you know, all of those things that we're blessed with, but time, I just feel like is ticking more, faster, if that makes sense, you know? Oh, yeah. I know it. you shouldn't have that in your head, but I've had people my age pass away. Eric right? Evans here a couple weeks ago. They're, sorry, yes. So sorry for mm -hmm. that. So I've had people that have grown their companies like, like I have from nothing to 75 to 100 hotels. And all they've done is work, work, work to grow it to that level. And then we talk about slowing down and spending quality time with your family and balancing that, right, with, their, with, their, with, the, with your family. And then they're no longer here. So those things, you know, get in your head and you start balancing things. Like, what are you doing all this for? You know, I still have that passion. I still have that love for what we do. But I will tell you, D, that I am doing much better job than I was 15 years ago or 10 years ago balancing my life. I used to work 12 hours a day. I would even go home. On, I would go to the office on weekends. Mm -hmm. and, and now this thing, 
<laughs> right? So you could come yeah. home, and I'll never forget one day my wife said, you know, she wanted me to be home at a certain time. I was a little bit late, but I made it. And she said, after a brief conversation with me, she said, why don't you just go back to the office? And I said, what do you mean I'm here? She said, physically you're here, but you're not here mentally and emotionally. And I think that we have to be present. You hear, hear that word a lot. No. And we have to work at it. And I, this thing right here, you got 10 emails that just came in at five o'clock, 5.30. Yeah. They need an answer from oh, me. God. It's in my head. I've got things that are going on. But it's not fair to your, to your significant other. It's not fair to your children. It's not fair to your loved ones. And so I talk about passion a lot. Passion is very, a very important ingredient to entrepreneurial success, right? Mm -hmm. But there's <clears throat> one downside. It could consume you. All right, but let's take the it other side you. of that. I'll play the devil's advocate because okay. I'm exactly, I, I'm, I'm right where you're at. But let's take the devil's act or the other side. <clears throat> Not that I'm agreeing with it, but let's say if you were the 25-year-old guy, 26-year-old, and you said, man, I know people in their early 30s that died. Well, if, if we thought that then, we wouldn't be where we're at you're today. Right. And if you'd have stayed in the cubicle, your wife might not even like you. <laughs> so the so even, even though maybe we think there's not as much time left over, we didn't have a guarantee then either. And if I if I if I don't have 15 things going, I'm not the same D. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't like me if I did, sure. if I was bored. So I don't really know the answer. And I probably don't either, D, and you bring up a very good point. I think when I was 26, 27, even though I may have had a friend or two pass away in their 30s, I wasn't thinking like that as much. Um, you know, I still feel like that, hey, I'm healthy, I'm young, I can live a long life. But when, you, when you're in your 50s and you start getting your 60s and 70s, sure, you still can have a very long life and a healthy life, but you do think about time a little differently and age a little differently, right? And I'm not saying drastically different. Well, and the odds are the odds yeah. are getting against us. That's right. I remember when I was turned 50, I talked to Jim Sharp. Did you ever know Jim? Yes. He was a good friend of mine. Jim Sharp is a prolific developer. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something he said that, that made a lot of sense, but, uh, but it was something to note. I said, when I was 50, I said, Jim, I said, can you still get out and invest and up for property in your 50. He said, D, when you're 50, you can do anything you want. You just can't mess up. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was That's funny. That, I'm not sure that that was good news or bad. <laughs> On the Courthouse Square at 30 Second Street is the law firm of Logan Thompson Law. Since 1965, they have served the legal needs for the good citizens of Cleveland Bradley County. If you've got a problem, they're no problem. Give them a call. In 08, did, in 08 things went horrible for me. It did you horrible. have the same experience? Oh, absolutely. I don't think anyone was immune to, to the Great Recession, right? I thought um, it was just me or something, but everybody No, no did. I mean, I think the bankrupty, bankruptcy attorneys uh, were probably the only ones making money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but about everybody was impacted, right? Uh, and especially if you're in real estate, um, you know, particularly hotels uh, took... took uh, but, you know, during that time, I'll have to go through that a little bit. We were a smaller company. Uh, we had maybe eight hotels uh, back then in 2008. And um, we just opened our largest hotel. It's a $27 million hotel in downtown Chattanooga, 13 stories, the double tree. And uh, I was so nervous. We opened it October of 2008. 
So it couldn't have opened it at a worse time, not, right? You could not have opened it yes. at worse. And and uh, it was it was nerve wracking, uh, but fortunately, again, some of it you got to put in luck. Uh, Chattanooga was a drive to destination. Uh, Volkswagen came online into you know with with the plant. It was a little while uh, they later, were starting. Mm -hmm. The plant came, I think, in ten or eleven, yeah. but they were starting to create a lot of travel demand yeah. uh, during a tough time. So I, I remember I was at a conference in 2009, a hotel conference, of the top 100 hotel markets in the country. Chattanooga was number one in least bad, in least bad. So the entire industry had dropped 17%. Chicago had dropped 25, 26%. Atlanta had dropped like 22%. And Chattanooga dropped 7%. That's it, 7%. And our portfolio didn't drop not even 7%, right? Because we had better brands and we were out with the way we were operating new, our hotels, new. new. And so we were able to weather that storm is, the, is what I like to, to use, the storm analogies. Um, and... So we, we were a small company at that time, but this is what happened, Dean. We wound up uh, creating a plan and said, you know what? This is the time to grow. And what does Warren Buffett say? Investors should be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Mm -hmm. So greedy is a harsh word, so let's change it to opportunistic. Mm -hmm. So in a fearful environment, we became opportunistic. And so we built nearly 12 hotels. And that, that time, that era defined who we are today. From 08 to 13 or something? In 10, well, we started the plan in 08, 09, mm -hmm. but we started opening them in like 11 through 14. Mm -hmm. We opened like that 11, 12 hotels from 11 to 14, 15, around that time. And construction cost was, had dropped dramatically. Sure. Mm -hmm. We're building stuff for 80, 90 bucks a square foot, and it was 120 bucks a square foot in 07. Mm -hmm. Land, I'll give you an example. There was $3 million piece of dirt in Atlanta, and it was under contract for 2.8. And so what do you think we, we could pick it up for? 1.6 at the time, things went so bad. We wound up picking it up for $900,000. Now, I'm not going to beat up anybody. Mm -hmm. They came to us. They that, were glad you came. They were glad. In that per yeah, period. I've never beat up anybody mm -hmm. in my life. Yeah. They came to us and said, you know what? I'll sell it to you for 900, 900 because I need to get out of this thing quickly. And their basis might have been only 100000 right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 20 years ago. And then we bought seven acres uh, for bank. Bank took it over. Um, the loan on the seven acres was two point seven million, and the bank said we will sell it to you for eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, all seven acres. And so, we wound up building a Hampton Inn on two of the acres and sold off the five acres for a lot more than that. Right. So in these difficult times, there could be great opportunities. And so we really grew this company during that time and more than doubled the size of our company by the time we were 2014, 2015. But here's the thing, D, confidence. It, it built confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, we had much more confidence. We had a little swagger now. And, uh, and we continued to build all the way through 2019 and then of course, the Another storm yeah. came, and it was pretty bad. It, it was, was worse bad. storm than 08, 09 for the hospitality business. And I always say this, the pandemic disproportionately impacted our industry, right? It impacted travel, the restaurant industry, a lot worse than it impacted other businesses. Even supply chain was absolutely, wrecked. absolutely. So, but these storms, you know, we use those analogies all the time, and I say this, and and I remember in two thousand nine, ten, I said, "Team, we're going to build the best brick house in the industry." 
You want a straw house when a storm comes, or you want a brick house? And what makes a brick house? For us, every company, every industry, it's different, okay? But for us, it was the brands that we're gonna partner with, Hilton and Marriott, okay? It was our um, um, locations, our markets that we're gonna be in, we wanted to make sure we were in growing markets and the markets that you we sort of got some of that from your civil background. That that absolutely. And then this is very important. We wanted to make sure our culture was strong, service culture. Remember, it's a people business, mm-hmm. right? I we have fourteen, fifteen hundred employees today. So these hotels aren't just real estate. Office is pure real estate, right? Multifamily is real estate. Mm-hmm. Industrial is pretty much pure real estate. Sure. But hotels are not pure real estate. It's real estate, but it's a service component of people on top of it. So it's really important how you operate your hotels is can define success too. So all of that makes a brick house. And so when the storm, that next storm came in 2020, it was pretty bad. I really believe we were more prepared than others for it because we knew that some storm, now no one would have predicted nobody, the pandemic. Nobody, nobody. But we knew in 19, I was at a conference on the main stage and they asked me the question about the economy. And I said, look, it's been 10 years since the Great Recession. Something is coming, okay? The clouds are starting to form. This can't go on forever, this cycle. And I don't know when or how bad it's going to be. Or what. Or what. Mm. But it's getting closer. So all you could do is be as prepared as you can. Okay? If I'm living in a hurricane zone down in Miami, then... Storms come maybe every 10 years or sooner than that yeah. there. And if it's been 11, you know you're getting you, close. You've got you to gotta be as prepared as you can. That's all I'm saying. You know, you can't be unprepared. And, and I'm going to tell you, no one was prepared for, for what happened with the pandemic. Nobody. No one. No Nobody. one. I never in my wildest imagination thought that I would have to shut a hotel completely down. Oh, it was bad. Uh, you know, we had materials delivered to one job to take to the next one because nobody was on that job, and the driver and delivery guys didn't want to be around. I mean, it got to where nobody knew the right thing to do. But it was, it took me, you know, like a year to build some buildings that would take six months because yeah. you had to have all the separation. It was a challenging was time, challenging. for sure. And, you know, the PPP loans that they gave mm-hmm. back, they were warranted. They really were. They were warranted. I'm a big believer that the government doesn't necessarily need to be involved um, in businesses and so forth. Um, but this was different. <laughs> was different. <laughs> this was different. Um, this was not our fault. Okay. And this was a lot of places that we were in. Like, Cleveland was pretty open, right? Florida was open. Mm-hmm. Oh, there yeah. There were places where we were, where we had hotels. Things were just completely shut down. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't even let people, um, you know, businesses open, restaurants open, hotels. I mean, they wanted things shut down. They would have put you in jail if you'd have done it. Yeah, absolutely. And who knew who was going to get sued later for staying open and somebody absolutely. got... Absolutely. Who knows? There was a lot of fear. And, and, and we're putting our employees in well, that's jeopardy. That's another thing, yeah. And so it was not our fault. And so the PPP, I was talking to our congressman about every other day during that early, early weeks in the, mm-hmm. in the pandemic, um, Congressman Fleshman, and educating him on what was going on uh, with in our industry, but I'll tell you, uh, D, that of the three hundred billion dollars mm-hmm. in round one PPP, mm-hmm. only nine percent went to hotels and restaurants. Only nine percent, and so a lot of other industries, companies wind up receiving, which is fine. 
but they ran out of mm -hmm. that, that money pretty quickly. And then there was a round two, mm -hmm. but the round two was more based on need, right? Now they have data. Like if your business right, was right. impacted. And you had to pay it back, or it didn't have to pay it back, you had to prove that you That's used right. it. So That's it really right. wasn't a windfall profit. It wasn't, yeah. it's, it wasn't, it was just barely like, oh, I mean, we, you had to, didn't you have to prove you, you had to prove you paid, you, you paid it out to employ, you know, you couldn't keep, it wasn't, right. it wasn't free money. No, it wasn't it free wasn't. money. And, and uh, also, you know, I really appreciate our lenders. Uh, so the way the government really also helped mm -hmm. was telling or, or talking to the lenders and the regulators to say, to say that, you know what, take it easy. <clears throat> and you need to help these borrowers and defer uh, and these these lo loan payments. And so the lenders all worked with us. Every single one of our lenders worked with us and helped us out during during that difficult time. You know, so that uh, helped a lot. I had one bank, it was a Capstar bank. They sent me a letter and said, we are deferring either your payments or the principal payments for like, I forget what it was, like six months or, and I didn't yeah. even ask. Yeah. And of course it was, it was, it was, there That's were small great. payments, but it, I really did appreciate that gesture. And they actually just did it on, did it. There is no question. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, the partnership uh, with our lenders and, and how re regulators were asked to, to kind of back away mm -hmm. and, and help these borrowers because, um, again, it wasn't uh, the, these business people's fault. No. Right? But you would have, you would have made it somehow, just like I did, just like everybody else did. We'd have figured out something, something to make it work. Do you, um, is that your helicopter that flies in next to the <laughs> motel there on the, uh, at Target. No, that's not my helicopter. I don't know whose helicopter it is. I wonder whose that is. But have you seen them there? I land? haven't. I haven't been uh, out this way. Uh, I mean, I, I've driven by it. I've come, come to Cleveland a few times, but I haven't seen. But you own that one there across from Target, right? The one that's open now? Or the, do you, are you we own the one? Hampton Inn. That's where I've, st I've stayed there several okay, times. Okay, yes, we I've own the Hampton there. Inn. I stayed there during COVID. Okay, great. That was the cleanest hotel I've ever stayed at. Well, I appreciate Bar that. None. Appreciate that, D. And guess what? Um, the city, I mean, the, the residents of Cleveland have voted that hotel number one. And in, here I didn't uh, even know best, that. Best of the best of the hotels in Cleveland. You must have a really good manager there. We have, you know, we have great people, D, but at the end of the day, it's, look, we have 40 plus hotels in nine states, right? Uh, so it's, it really comes down to culture, you know, culture of, of just getting, having great people with great attitudes, taking care of them, leading with your heart uh, is so important to our organization. What are your values? What are your beliefs? And everybody lined uh, up uh, and aligned, I should say, with those values and beliefs. And so, yes, we have a fantastic general manager there. Um, it was actually her birthday yesterday, Leanna. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but she's uh, a great GM. We have a great team. As you know, a great leader surrounds themselves with great people, right? There's about 25, 30 employees there. And so she can't do it by herself. And she surrounded herself with really good, really good That's people. That's not too expensive over there either. No, uh, I mean, it it's, it's a mid-scale mid mm -hmm. hotel. Yeah. We are developing another hotel across the street from the Hampton. Uh, at some point, uh, we'll be building that sometime next year. I remember they used to say, Cleveland can't handle another motel, but that was all wrong. That was back in the late 80s. They said Cleveland can't handle another. People just have no... The hotel business is, is based a lot about how many is riding, driving down the interstate. So right. it doesn't really matter how many is in Cleveland, it's how yeah. many is on the interstate. Yeah. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Obviously, interstate traffic is, uh, no question, a big demand generator. But the city of Cleveland has grown so much, right, over the last 25, 30 years. And so there's Bakker and uh, m and m and 
and there's a Volkswagen not too far away, right, uh, off of exit nine, mm -hmm. and then Sharing Plow and Lee University is growing, Church of God. I mean, there's just so much, so much of that, all of that uh, together is uh, created more demand for business, and uh, the population of Cleveland is, and Bradley County has grown uh, all the way north up to Charleston, right? There's mm -hmm. been a lot of growth yep. up there. So, yeah, Cleveland has done well uh, growing. And look, restaurants, I'm sure 20 years ago, people said we can't afford to have another restaurant. <laughs> and look at how many yeah. more restaurants have come in, uh, in Cleveland as well. So it all works out. Sometimes you can get overbuilt, and, uh, and that does happen, but it takes time to absorb it. Uh -huh. And uh, so we've got quite a few hotels uh, that are under construction or coming. So there is that little fear of getting overbuilt, but it's temporary. temporary I, don't, I wouldn't worry yeah. about that yeah. because uh, uh, Cleveland can handle four or five more big motels. That's not matter. Well, I hope, I hope that is correct because we are building and we are in the market. In You're the first one I've known in Cleveland that had music pipe through the... Through the hotel. Okay, yeah. I thought that was really <clears throat> interesting. As long as it's not in the guest rooms, right? Just in the public no, it was, spaces. No, it's in yeah. the elevators mm -hmm. and in the yeah. lobby. It's just a subtle, yeah. very subtle, but it adds an atmosphere that you don't, yes. you don't realize. So how many motels do you have now, 40 or 60? No, so we have 40-plus uh, hotels in nine states, and we own and operate... <coughs> All of those hotels, and uh, we have another 16 hotels that are in our pipeline, about a half a billion dollars in development. W will that, you be, w w are all of these operated from Broad Street? From your all office? of those are operated from Broad Street, yes. We have a team of nearly 50 people at our home office there on Broad Street. Uh, now, we do have some remote people too. Now, where, where is it? It's, I don't know exactly where your place is. I just know it's yeah. Broad Street. It's uh, it's right there where uh, two blocks from the aquarium, uh, right there near our Hampton Inn Suites in downtown Chattanooga, right on Broad Street. You know where Sticky Fingers is? Oh, yeah. Uh, right across the street. Oh, okay. From Sticky Fingers, there's a five guys down the street. Mm -hmm. uh, so we built this office building in 14 uh, ground floors retail. So we have tenants on the ground floor. And then three stories of office, and we occupy all three stories. So you're, you're from there. You're managing forty plus hotels <clears throat> and sixteen more in the pipeline. That is correct. So we have sixteen. And you're thinking about slowing down and balancing your. Well, uh, I'll tell you how we're slowing down. So sure, uh, my wife does remind me of that often. I thought you were supposed to be slowing down. Yeah. Um, D, it comes down to surrounding yourself with great people at the end of the day, right? Um, I just, we brought aboard a COO, successfully recruited him from Atlanta with three preteen kids to Chattanooga and Harvard MBA, uh, very intelligent, great drive, uh, shares our values and beliefs. Uh, so he joined our organization just 90 days ago, and he's doing a fantastic job. I just so brought he, aboard. Does, yeah. does he take the, a lot of the questions away from you? Absolutely. A lot of the operations, uh, you know, he, look, I like to still be vested, engaged. Uh, I still pick up the phone and call my general managers to congratulate them and say, what a great job. I'll text them, you know, happy birthday or whatever it is, personal do you get like any that. texts saying uh, they're out of towns? No, I don't get. Do you ever texts get, you ever like get texts saying third shift didn't show? No, I don't get texts like that. Uh, <laughs> but you did. I used to. Absolutely, I used to. And I, I actually went and did the third shift. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so it wasn't just okay. Third shift didn't show up. I'm the one who had to go there to do third shift. When did that stop? Oh, that stopped a long time ago when we were probably Three years or 10 years ago? Uh, no, no. I would say Before 08? 20 plus years Before ago 08? it stopped. Yeah, that stopped 20 plus years ago. The first five years, I, I, five, six years I experienced that. And then I started building the team so what I did could you, go what, do the things I needed to do. What did you hire first? Yeah, so one of the first persons that I hired, you know, so I'll go back, that first hotel D that I was the general manager of, mm -hmm. 
um, I had this vision of developing a second hotel and a third hotel, and I couldn't just be the general manager of this hotel anymore and then take on these ventures, mm -hmm. right? And so there was a boardroom on the second floor of the hotel. There was a boardroom, and I took the boardroom sign off. It said boardroom. That's, that's mm -hmm. what the sign yeah. was. I took that off, and I came up with a company name, and it was Vision Hospitality Group. Mm -hmm. And I put that sign up, and I was the only corporate employee. And, it was, and I made it a little office with a little table, and it was smaller than this room. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, the birth of Vision Hospitality Group, but I was the only employee, but I was a proud owner and operator of a development management company. And the first person I had to hire was a general manager. So I hired a general manager to help run that first hotel, right? And, uh, and I'm fortunate that it was a good hire. Because uh, it could have been bad. It could have been bad. It could have taken everything another trajectory. Yeah, right? he, he did a great job. He wound up actually, um, he wound up, his name is Derek Dawes, and he wound up uh, owning his own hotel or two, I think. And he's got all the buddies barbecues now in this area. Is that right? Yeah, that's him. And so he was, I always knew this guy has some entrepreneurial mm -hmm. spirit in him. And You got uh, him started. Well, I mean, I, I hope that I had something to do with that, but he was, uh, you know, a good understudy and uh, I was hands-on uh, helping him uh, manage that hotel. And so he did that, that was my first hire and I'm glad it was a good one. And then my wife actually did all the bookkeeping. So QuickBooks, right? Oh, from home? Yeah, no, she she came to the office. I mean, and uh, back then it was like the, this whole working from home and yeah. technology wasn't, yeah. we weren't as savvy then, you know? So she came so to that boardroom? She room. came to that boardroom and helped me pay bills. And I paid the bills through QuickBooks and I reconciled myself. I even did payroll. In quick pay, mm -hmm. I, I, I did W twos. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Staples and getting the W two forms mm -hmm. and figuring it out how to put it in the printer and printing the W twos so I could mail them to my employees. You know, and some of them were no longer your employees yeah, anymore. Right. But you still got to give them the yeah. W twos. So I have done about everything in this business, and my wife and I still, you know, back then. I mean, she helped me do laundry, and we even made beds. And, oh yeah, and and did all that, and so there was a lot there that 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 we were doing, and but diligently grew the company, and uh, then you know then there was a time to to move out of the that hotel, and that CBL was building a new office building across the mall. I remember, yeah, and I wound up leasing 1,300 square feet. Well, I bet that was expensive. Oh, it was expensive. How much was that? Oh, at that time, I was paying, it wasn't crazy, but, but $3,000 a month I was paying uh, in lease. But it was only 1,300 square feet, right? Yeah, you almost don't need 1,300 feet because that's yeah. not that much. Yeah, so, and, but... Well, I, had you outgrown that little boardroom? That's it. That boardroom was only like maybe 300 square feet, mm -hmm. right? So 1,300 square feet is a big yeah. jump. And so I had uh, 1,300 square feet, but it was just, again, myself initially. And then I hired a, a assistant uh, receptionist slash everything. <laughs> How many motels did you have at that time? Uh, at okay. that time, we had opened probably four hotels. We had four. So you were warranted 1,300 square feet at a different location That's at right. that point. We had four, but we were building, we had this ambition to build three, four more. So you can't just look at D where you are today, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta know where the puck is going, mm -hmm. right? And so we, we knew that it wasn't the four hotels, it was the eight and 10 that we needed to make sure that we had the infrastructure to manage, right? And because uh, you don't want to, you don't want to get too far behind and then constantly trying to catch up. So my strategy or our strategy was always let's get ahead. It may be some risks that we're taking because not everything may materialize. But believe in yourself. Believe in where you're going. 
and build the infrastructure accordingly. And even when we built that four-story office building at that time, we had maybe 12 hotels, 13. And people were going, whoa, that's a pretty, I was planning on leasing that second floor and third mm -hmm. floor. And then I wind up uh, taking it all because of how fast we were growing. You're a big planner. That's your that's your uh, strength. Well, I guess that company name Vision applies. Yeah, right? I guess so. And yeah. uh, I think you've got to have vision in in business. Yes, I mean you have to know where you want to go, where you think you could go, if you want to get there. Things just don't happen. They don't just. <laughs> you happen. Know, it doesn't just. <clears throat> accidentally fall in your lap and I think you have to um, you know I've never done a, some strategic plan I never came up with a, a hundred page or fifty page report to say this is what I'm gonna do it's here and it's on little pieces of paper and now on my yellow notes on my phone right mm -hmm. on my iPhone but I'll put thoughts down and I will I'm gonna send you a book D Okay. What's the name of it? I wrote a book. Is that right? Yeah, I What's wrote the a name of book. It? It's, it's called True Blue. It's a name of our culture. and uh, Your culture being your Indian... Not... not, not no, so your, that's in the book. Okay. The Indian culture... You're talking about the motel. That is in oh, the book, our story and our journey. A little bit of how my father came to this country and how we grew up. And there's a, there's a picture of our family of four from, from California mm -hmm. in there. Um, but the book is more on the corporate culture that we've developed, you know, in our company. And so that's what, so it's a, the, the book is about the journey and the story, but it's about, a, it's a culture book about our company culture. And why this was important to me is all these thoughts were in my head and I wanted to put it on paper and put it in a book. Now, if it's a prospective employee, or even a current employee. Mm -hmm. This book is not like, yeah, we published, I mean, we, we printed a lot of copies, but it's not something to be, you know, I'm not a writer. I'm not uh, uh, So it's a it. company mission statement That's in it. a sense. That's what it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's basically our values, our beliefs, our mission, our vision, and, uh, and this is our approach. If you share them, then join us. We're not going to change our values of integrity. Well, that's a good idea. Of the golden rule of respect. Mm -hmm. We're not going to change that. But if you share those things, come join us. And that's what we've done. And I'll send you a copy. Well, that's a good idea because if you're, if you're going to work there, you can say, what do I do about this? Well, here's what this, this book says. This is the culture. We want to be good to the customers and et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a roadmap. I, mm -hmm. I use it to make decisions as well. I mean, if it's a tough decision I need to make. How many pages are in it? Oh, I don't know, maybe 100. It's an easy read. <laughs> 100 over 100 page pages. Plan. It's 100 page, <laughs> over 100. But, I mean, a lot of it's just uh, mm -hmm. there's storytelling yeah. in there. There's em employees and partners and, and lenders mm -hmm. telling a little bit about their interaction with mm -hmm. us. It's yeah. all in there. It's a, yeah, send me that. I really uh, enjoyed yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I will you're, say the, now the the Indian culture, your your Indian culture, not the business culture, but they are Indians are very good at business. Do you know Nikita Patel and Jack? Nikita and Jack. Yeah, Patel. I, I'm sure that they I've own met several them. convenience stores. Yeah, I've met them. I've They're met really them. really yeah. smart, really hard working. Nikita is. Uh, you'll be hearing her. She's really up and coming and. And really smart. Great. But anyway, uh, you you are not really slowing down as far as your vision for the future. You've just found a way to to delegate the work of it. Whereas before, you'd be thinking, "How am I going to clean these rooms and have yeah. this many motels?" Now it's more strategic planning for the future and placing yourself and and that sort of thing, right? Absolutely, D. I mean, look, uh, there's only so many hours in the day and hours in the week, right? Uh -huh. And so I've just gotten better at time management and managing that balancing, obviously, my family, 
my wife, my kids, my parents, and all that. But then when I am at the office, even how I manage my time there accordingly, I don't need to be in every meeting like I used to. Every vendor that uh, wants to sell me carpet or something, you know, I don't need to be in those yeah. meetings, you know. Even if it's a lender, I don't necessarily have to be in every meeting uh, with, with them or every internal meeting, right? So that means people under you are spending money at their discretion. Well, I don't know if it's just at discretion. You've got to empower. I mean, you surround yourself with great yeah. people. You empower them. There are, there are budgets that we have for projects. There are budgets that we have for for revenues and expenses on an existing hotel. And then you have to give them, you've got to empower them to perform. I mean, so we use this analogy of a, of, a, of a tree, okay? And the trunk of the tree is your culture, okay? And there, you've got to have strong foundation, deep roots, uh, and the only way a service a uh, company like ours could be successful is to have a strong culture. Look at Chick-fil-A, right? Who can, no one could argue why Chick-fil-A is so successful. Mm. I was at uh, the Chick-fil-A yesterday. My kids wanted to eat at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and it's always Saturday because Sunday it's going to yeah, be closed. Right. So Saturday they know that. So yeah, they, yeah. they, they want to go there. And the line was wrapped around <sighs> Chick-fil-A at like five o'clock in the afternoon. It wasn't even six or seven. No. And Popeyes next door? Nobody there. There were like three employee cars, I think. Now you figure. Is what I saw. Nothing against Popeyes, right. okay? Because I know you got 28,000 yeah. people yeah. that listen to you. But the culture of Chick-fil-A is so strong, you know, that, that it's, yes, it's the product, the marketing and all that, but the people at the end of the day make Chick-fil-A successful. And so that's so important. So the, the trunk is the culture. You have to water it. So you're, you're asking, what do I have to spend my time? I gotta make sure I'm watering it, fertilizing it, nurturing it every day. I gotta make sure that culture is strong. And then the outcomes are for us, every company might have different outcomes, right? But for us, it's guest satisfaction, very important, right? If you take care of that, that, that customer, they're mm. going to come back. But guess what? You can't have an engaged and happy customer if you don't have an engaged and happy employee. So that's the trunk. And if you have an engaged and happy employee, like Chick-fil-A employees are, like employees at our company, then you're going to have happy customers. And so there's a direct relationship between those two things, by the way. And then market share, every business is competitive. So it's about gaining market share and growing market share. And that's the other branch of the tree. And the third branch is profitability. And it's a business. So you have to generate a certain profitability, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are three things that we measure and we reward. And so at the end of the day, D, this is what I'm saying that you can't micromanage at this stage in our company and at this level. If you really want to grow and you want to balance work and life, then you have to be able to surround yourself with great people, making sure that they share those same values and beliefs and you do with the culture, right? And then have clear expectations. It can't be fuzzy. Clear expectations of what you want to accomplish, right? And what your goals are. And look, and there's gonna be obstacles. There's gonna be where you're not getting to where you need to be. And, but you work through those together, right? And that's how, you're, that's how you can really grow this company. I don't want to say, you know what? I'm not gonna grow this company anymore because I don't have the time. No. You, you, why, why should I do that? There are a lot of talented people that you could bring aboard that could help you give them a piece of the pie too. Give them a piece of the pie. There's another quote that I often use, Vince Lombardi, right? Mm -hmm. the, the iconic coach. Mm -hmm. he, would, he would say that a sign of a great leader is how many times he, and I'll say she today too, he and she crosses that goal line, okay? And how many people, sorry, 
that they take with them, okay? So it's not how many times he or she crosses that goal line. I didn't say that 100% accurate. How many people they take across with them is a sign of a great leader. Uh -huh. So I was that scrawny little kid that wind up getting in the game 26 years ago and worked hard, found my passion, got the ball, right? And I've scored so many touchdowns now over the last 26 years, right? Through hard work, mm -hmm. you have two and so forth. But now what does the next 25 years look like? I wanna take more people across with me, across that goal line. Now I proportionately may not uh, make as much, right? Proportionately in terms of the whole pie, but I want to be able to give it to key stakeholders in our company that are gonna help me accomplish these goals and create a system in the next 10, 15, 20 years to do that. And that is on a larger uh, scale, on a 10, 15,000 foot, sorry, viewpoint of what we want to do as a company. So we have 16 hotels in our pipeline, but we have even more after that. And I can't do it by myself. So we've got a great team and that's what we're doing together to do that. I don't know if you realize how um, respected you are in, in the Cleveland community. I mean, when you, when you talk to other hotel owners, to bankers, to accountants, your name is inevitably brought up. I'm and, surprised. And, I, yeah. I, and, and that's it's you. You're really more of a of a legend than I <laughs> think you sad. than I think you realize. That, that, I mean, look, uh, that's flattering, D. I um, mean, you would think you'd be seventy years old, but here nah. you are, younger than me. That's flattering. This town means a lot to me, and I think uh, the people that go back to at the end of the day, a town is just the physical buildings and roads and so forth, but the people make a community, right? And so it's a great, great uh, community, and I'm honored that people say those things, um, and it's always good to be back here. It's undisputed. Well, I'm glad that it's undisputed, but I, I appreciate that. It means a lot. I'm so glad I, I got, to, got to see you at, at Chuck Flashman's thing. Yes, he had, yes. what, a couple, what, two months ago? Boy, oh, isn't he a great guy? I think, look, uh, he Chuck, is. Congressman Fleischman is a fighter. He's a fighter, and he'll fight for you. And that's, the, that's what his greatest asset is. I have never seen anyone out-hustle, out-work him. You and I appreciate that kind of hustle we do. and work. And, and he is just, uh, you know, he doesn't just pass things to other people. He will take it on himself. He'll personally you know, make the calls and so forth, what we well, need Well, wouldn't do. he yeah. be a great employee? Oh, yeah. Oh, he boy, would. he would be he good, would. wouldn't he? Uh, so he's, I admire, I admire him a lot. And I, I'll tell you, we would, uh, this ho the hotel industry and the PPP and all those things, I mean, he gets a lot of credit because uh, we were talking to him about every... He's on some big committees. He is. He's moving up. He's becoming a senior congressman now. I guess so, yeah. yeah. You know, to sum it up, to be in business, you have to hustle. Yep. You have to have a passion. And and maybe the next step is is don't slide into home, but run home. Right? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, and then one more thing that we talked about, I think you've got to do it with the utmost um, integrity and, uh, and, and treat your people with utmost respect and admiration. And uh, I think that's really important. I think too often people forget that part. You can't do it yourself. And I've, I'm, I'm bad about that too, because uh, I've become really f good friends with the people that work for me and almost like family. And you know how that gets when you're like family, you're, you're apt to argue with them more than you would a stranger. Oh, well, that's not a bad thing, D. I mean, you know, treating your team like family, I'd rather do that any day than the opposite, right? And so what, what family may argue, 
family may not see eye to eye all the time, but family has each other's they're back. They're going to be there. They're going they to be have, there even though they're arguing. They have each other's back, and they're loyal, and they're committed, and they're dedicated, and it's unconditional. And so those things uh, are really important. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, talk about leadership, uh, you know, there's two ways to lead. Um, and I always say this. One is out of fear which cannot be sustainable. No. Okay, I could tell somebody to move a box from one place to another and demand it, mm -hmm. and they'll do it for a little bit, and that's about it. Yeah. Or out of deep admiration and mutual respect. And when you have uh, leaders in your organization with people that will say, I will do anything, I'll go through a brick wall for that person, that's when you know that you have something special. I use the analogy, I'll spend a little time in jail for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Hey, All thanks right. for coming. Hey, I really for enjoyed me. it. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it.